Good afternoon. You're listening to Clearing the Air on KFCF 88.1 FM, Fresno. I'm your host, Dolores Weller. I'm the director for the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition. KFCF can be heard from Merced all the way down to Delano in the San Joaquin Valley, where you can also listen online at www.kfcf.org. And this program, Clearing the Air, runs every fourth Friday at 3 p.m. and is your source for air pollution solutions in the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, our organization, the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, is a partnership of more than 70 community, medical, public health, environmental, and environmental justice organizations that represent thousands if not millions of residents in the San Joaquin Valley and our mission is to create clean air in the valley and and doing that through policy change to improve public health and to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to be involved in the decision-making process Um, and so today I thought it'd be a great opportunity to update uh, listeners on some of the air quality issues that are going on in the valley at the moment. There's a lot of activity, um, so I wanted to, to bring you all up to speed. Specifically, there is a uh, planning process underway that uh, many agencies and uh, groups and uh, individuals are involved with to reduce PM 2.5, our wintertime pollution. And there's also some uh, concerning attacks on the Clean Air Act, um, just with the new political climate, and um, some of those efforts are coming from the Valley. So we want to make, you, make sure that you are aware of uh, both of those issues. And to talk about those, we've invited uh, Kevin Hamilton. Kevin, are you on the line? Oh, yeah. Great. So Kevin Hamilton is a director for the Central California Asthma Collaborative, and he also serves on the uh, Valley Air District's Citizens Advisory Committee, their Environmental Justice Advisory Group, and also on the State Air Resources Board Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. So he is well aware of, of all of the um, air quality policy, and he's also serving on a public work group that's working on the PM 2.5 plan that I just mentioned. So thanks, Kevin, for joining. My pleasure. All right. So as as I said, we want to update listeners on the planning process for PM 2.5. And maybe we could start with a, a refresher for our uh, listeners. What is... PM 2.5, and why should be we be concerned about it here in the San Joaquin Valley? Well, PM 2.5, to put it simply, is a very, very tiny, about one thirtieth the size of a human hair diameter of particle. And when you breathe it in, uh, it can actually move all the way through the natural defenses the human body has, all the hairs and mucus in your nose and your throat and your lungs, and end up in your bloodstream. So naturally, we're a little bit worried about what it's made out of. So if it's just made out of common uh, dust or dirt, you know, that's bothersome, uh, and you wouldn't want a lot of it accumulating in your body, but maybe not so terrible. But if you've got a chemical riding along with that, which is the situation we have very often here in the valley, uh, that's maybe a pesticide-related chemical or from some industrial processors, from diesel exhaust or, you know, any one of a number of things, and it's moving into your body. Well, now you're talking about things like cancer risk, diabetes risk, heart disease, all kinds of health problems. We know now it's even linked to dementia. Um, you know, this is, this is pretty scary stuff. And, and of course, the big problem here is we have some of the highest levels of PM2.5 in the nation right here in San Joaquin Valley and various parts of the valley on any given day. So, uh, big problem. Right, right. And what, so what would you say are some of the health um, consequences, health effects of PM 2.5? Since we, it is a, a, a problem here in the San Joaquin Valley, we have seen um, some trends that are concerning for our wintertime pollution. We do have the stagnation of air mixed with our geography, but also all of the activity that's going on here in the valley that contributes to our local air pollution. Um, so how does that impact our 
our our uh, our health, you know, short term and long term. So uh, the short term impact are we see increases in things like heart attack. So the PM two point five. Uh, moving into your bloodstream can trigger a reaction that, that starts inflammation or swelling in the arteries. Uh, it happens to be really friendly about the arteries that provide blood to your heart, also to your brain. So for people uh, who are already at risk for these kinds of problems, and even those who aren't, uh, sudden heart attacks, uh, myocardial infarction, or a, a sudden clamping down or spasming of those arteries can happen. Um, and people can literally die or have a stroke. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also triggers asthma attacks. And people who already have asthma, we haven't been able to draw the link tightly enough to say absolutely this causes asthma. We we'll talk a little bit more about how that link is, how, they, how that that evidence is building around that. But um, but we know for sure that it actually triggers asthma attacks. So again, another short-term effect that can have long-term consequences is the triggering of an asthma attack. So those are sort of the the big pictures. Uh, we have research now that shows us there's a relationship long-term for things like diabetes uh, and obesity. Uh, it appears that, again, and this is brand new, hot off the presses just last year from UC Berkeley and UCSF, uh, where we actually have information now building that chain of custody, if you will, sort of the link that show us that this same process, this release of all this inflammatory stuff, this, this, these chemicals that make things swell up and act funny inside your body, are also working along those same pathways that make people more prone to be obese, or less likely to not to lose to not lose weight, and more likely to end up with diabetes, which is another epidemic sort of running through the valley along with asthma and heart disease. So. Mm-hmm. Definitely want to to echo that PM two point five is a serious um, uh, issue for for uh, respiratory any respiratory illnesses um, contributing to or worsening and 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 like you said Kevin cardiovascular health um, uh, because of the 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 size of the particle and being able to enter our lungs and kind of bypass our our defenses so um, definitely important to to look at and and figure out what we can do about um, reducing this this pollutant here in the San Joaquin Valley what would you say are some of like the top uh, sources of PM 2.5 in the valley I know that in every region it's going to be different based on the activity um, that goes on in those in the different air basins what would you say are top sources here in the valley so I, I would say the two top sources are are diesel trucks and burning, mm-hmm. all kinds of burning, whether it's fireplaces or open burning in fields or burning that happens with cooking, uh, especially if you're cooking in a, a large industrial size space where your, your whole business is at and you've got, you know, a half a million square feet that's dedicated to making a product that requires you to be cooked. Um, everything that that you that is associated with combustion is going to have a PM 2.5 consequence. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we're when those activities are happening, uh, this kind of thing can be filtered, but the filter technology can be challenging and expensive, uh, and some people just don't want to don't want to pay that price. So those would be you know that would be the primary sources that that I would be concerned about. Yeah, and and it's I'm concerned about by the way. <laughs> sure, sure. And I think it's really important as you as you just did to point out that it's not just, you know, trucks and residential burning, which I think is kind of it's it really easy for uh, the general public to to um, understand. But there's so many other forms of, of combustion, like you said, commercial cooking on a large scale down to restaurants that are um, operating charbroilers to biomass facilities that are uh, burning ag waste to trash incinerators um, and, and as you mentioned open ag burning that we're seeing more of as well and we've covered on, on this show so um, all sources of direct PM 2.5 so really important to, to look at those further if, we, if, if, if it was 
just one of those things going on here, uh, it wouldn't be so such a big problem. But unfortunately, we've got all of those things happening quite often at the same time. So it's not just the individual source, but it's the cumulative impact. It's the accumulated amount all gathered together in one place and mixing that creates this chemical stew that you're breathing that causes these problems. So um, it, it's, you know, any solution has to be focused at all of the areas as well. Right. You can't single one out and say, oh, I'll just take that one away and now everything's going to be fine. There's a, a prevailing thought that, oh, we'll just deal with the diesel pollution from the trucks and then we'll be fine. Well, that's just not true because you'll still have the, you know, seven or eight uh, other things that we've talked about, and I didn't even get into the idea of oil refineries or uh, just the idea of, of uh, taking oil out of the ground and and the associated pollution that comes with that in terms of, say, methane release, PM2.5 release. Um, you know, they're all happening together, and so we have to actually address all of them. And that's the air district job. And right. Air resource support. And, and that, that brings me to sort of this this new planning effort that's going that's underway at the moment um, for a PM 2.5 plan we know the federal EPA sets standards based on science and health um, to for air quality and the district puts together plans to address those standards but we're going through a unique process at the moment um, for the current PM 2.5 plan can you tell us kind of how that all came to be Sure. So when we were uh, working with the Air District a few years ago on the ozone plan, we proposed the idea of uh, working with the community more effectively on the planning process because before that it, it had been sort of the community trying to get a, uh, a handle on it and trying to bring their ideas to the table. And, and then you've got the regulators on the other side who are more trapped in sort of their environment. Nobody's really communicating well with each other. And there's a lot of frustration. So we, we pitched this idea and the Air District agreed that we would not only work together on it in a, in this idea of a public advisory work group, uh, that has everybody at the table, the folks who will be regulated as well as the community as well as the regulators. So you've got everybody at the table, which is always good, uh, and an opportunity for more public involvement. And you're working instead of just working on a single plan, because often there's several PM 2.5 plans because there's different health thresholds, one for across the whole year, how you're exposed, and another one is your daily exposures. And that's to protect you against a daily spike that might get overlooked because in the annual, you're looking at sort of an average across the year, you want to prevent both. Uh, and that can be very confusing and difficult and time-consuming, especially if the public's trying to participate. So with those, then we looked at rolling two or three of these together in one combined plan, and it came out pretty well. We ended up with a plan that looks like it's actually going to get us the clean air uh, within about the time frame it needs to happen for for that particular. But with PM 2.5, we didn't have that. So I think with good work from folks at CVAC and others, uh, the community stating, you know, that we want to do this again. This is the thing we should be doing for this particular pollutant. That came together. And we've started that process. And where we're, where we are right now is, is the, inf what I call the information gathering piece, where all of the, in the, uh, information about where, how much and where it's coming from is, is being presented to everybody. And then the potential solutions to that and a, a really good discussion about, uh, uh, which of those solutions is viable in the short term and the long term. And out of that, at the other end, we hope by next fall to actually have a, a plan to get us there. Right, right. And and just to, to add to that as well, um, what sort of kicked off this process is that uh, advocates uh, raise the concern that some of the, a lot of these plans were kind of getting rubber stamped, going through the agencies, and then getting kicked back when when they were reaching the the EPA federal level um, for not really uh, meeting the the um, requirements um, and and demonstrating that they would be able to attain um, the standard. And so we have been advocating for for many years, many years, almost a, a decade, I would say, for specific issues. 
um, that you know we want the the district and other agencies to also explore uh, to reduce PM two point five and ozone. And in this case. Um, the State Air Resources Board um, wants to take a second look and, and uh, asking everyone to go back to the, the drawing board, so to speak. And, um, and that's what this whole process is about. And so it's a really unique opportunity for, for everyone to be involved. Um, like, like Kevin said, the regulators, the public, and all of the agencies are working on this together and um, doing a lot of information gathering and figuring out where are the opportunities. Um, and I'm going to just pause here for a, a, a quick um, a quick pledge break, Kevin, but when we get back, I'm going to, I want to talk about um, what are some of the things that advocates are asking for in order to, to reduce PM 2.5. Um, and I, this show is, is very ne- unique. I don't think you're going to hear a, 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 sh- a radio show in the San Joaquin Valley um, on air quality um, with kind of our angle. So I think that this is such a unique program, and we've been on this pr- uh, station for, gosh, probably uh, maybe the, the 10 years or so. I'm not sure, Rich, but um, I, our engineer over here might might, might know that. Um, but KFCF is listener supported. It's a hundred percent from from listeners, and your support keeps KFCF on the air and keeps clearing the air on the air on the air and um, keeping listeners informed about the latest in, in air quality issues and and how to get involved. So we have greatly appreciated the opportunity to be on this program and. Um, connect with listeners throughout the San Joaquin Valley and also be online streaming and, and having our, our message um, elevated. So we, we urge you to pledge your support to KFCF. Um, you can go to kfcf.org um, and, uh, or the quickest way is to call the 800 name, uh, number 1-800-439-5732. That's 800 800- Four three nine five seven three two. You can also sign up for a subscription, um, and any help um, is greatly appreciated. And you will be part of the KFCF family of supporters. So, encourage you to to keep this show going and um, uh, help us. You know, keep our our message alive. Um, so, going back to you. Uh, Kevin, we're talking to Kevin Hamilton from the uh, Central California Asthma Collaborative, and we're talking about PM 2.5 planning process, our wintertime pollution, we're finding ways to reduce that, and we're going to get into talking about the Clean Air Act in a little while, um, attacks on the Clean Air Act that are coming from the Valley, unfortunately. So, um, Kevin, what are some of just maybe a top two or three things that advocates are asking for under this current PM 2.5 plan? Well, we want the rules to be the most stringent possible. Uh, for instance, uh, with regard to open burning, we need to ban open burn. So, and when we talk about what we would do with that waste, we believe strongly that this is carbon waste. Uh, it's generally, uh, woody egg waste kinds of things and occasionally construction waste, but mostly woody egg waste. And it needs to go back in the ground. That's the best place for it. And that, that's where nature always intended it to be. And that's where farmers for literally thousands of years have put their waste is back in the ground. It's only in the last 20 or 30 years at the very most that we've come up with all these uh, various different ways of dealing with that waste outside of just putting it in the ground. So uh, we believe strongly that we need to to ban that open burning and limit uh, the amount of biomass production that actually happens. And uh, we want to see uh, incentives for using mulching as a as a as uh, an alternative to this. Another thing that we have not ever seen uh, from the Air Resources Board, this comes from, and the open burning would come from our local air district, but this problem is complicated and it requires more than one agency to do this work. So off-road agricultural equipment uh, has received a lot of incentive over the years, which is great. It's great. And I know that there's been hundreds of tractors and other pieces of equipment replaced, which we all support. 
but there's never been a drop dead date for changing this technology out when, okay, you need to get rid of that old polluting equipment. And, and so we need ARB, Air Resources Board of California, to finally step up and put this rule on the ground to regulate this agricultural equipment. It's just not happened. So uh, another big, big piece is uh, we don't see a big section with regard to transportation, and especially, again, referring back to diesel, but uh, other things, uh, delivery trucks and things like that. And we have a ton of, uh, no pun intended, in the valley. <laughs> uh, the technology is there to upgrade them, and, and ARB is putting a lot of money into pilots in various places. We've got a few, but nothing compared to the money they're investing in Southern California and Northern California in the Bay Area, at least. Uh, and we want an, a level playing field there. We want them to make those same investments here in the Valley. So we understand that these businesses are here and they're likely to stay here, uh, distribution centers and things like that. But we want them to be as clean as possible. And so we want to see, again, those those delivery trucks and the bus fleets updated uh, and invested in at the same time. So that's that's pretty much. You asked me for. Yeah, the, and and we I've do. Got a whole list. <laughs> yeah, we do have a whole list. And if listeners want to learn more about you know the the list of recommendations that we've made, I will um, share our contact info at the end. Um, but there are others like you know related to the residential um, fireplace, uh, residential burning, uh, char broiling, as we mentioned earlier. Um, within the oil and gas industry as well, there are other recommendations. So really there's a list and we're, like Kevin said earlier, we're at the, uh, data collection stage right now in this planning process and we really want to see what are the opportunities, um, what are the incentives mixed with regulations that we can really get some, some reductions, um, for PM 2.5. So, um, some important dates if people want to get involved with the PM 2.5 planning process, um, there is a workshop happening on uh, March 1st at 2 o'clock at the three uh, locations that the district has in Fresno, um, Modesto, and Bakersfield. And that is a public advisory work group um, work, uh, meeting, and the public is, is invited. And so the work group is currently on, in the phase of looking at the sources that are under the district's control. And uh, so that'll be a, a great conversation to be a part of. And then following that, there is a kind of bigger uh, workshop for the, just the public um, on the 9th, same time, 2 to, f- two to 4, um, in the same location. So um, we'll also post those on our Facebook page um, so that you can um, make sure that you can keep those on your calendar. Um, but those are great opportunities to be, to attend. And then also the state air resources board will be, um, doing their own process as well. So it's, it would be great if everyone can, can participate where they can, um, to learn more and, and kind of raise their, their concerns about any, any number of these issues that we've brought up. Um, so Kevin, we, I want to talk about the Clean Air Act. Um, this, these two issues go hand in hand because some of the concerns that are coming out of um, the San Joaquin Valley, some of the efforts led by um, our local elected, some of the efforts led by our district, the air district itself, um, looking for ways to change the Clean Air Act that we have been, the Central Valley Air Quality Coalition has been strongly opposed to. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what what's that, that tension there? Sure. So the Clean Air Act, just retrospectively, has been around since 1970-71, and it guaranteed Congress at that time saw the need, uh, interestingly enough, under the control of the existing party that now uh, has uh, the presidency, that, the, the, that every citizen in this country, every resident, uh, had a right to breathe clean air. And it laid out a structure for that, and it identified and places where this wasn't happening, and it also described a process by which this would be changed, would be fixed, and who would oversee that that happening. And it set out some uh, penalties for not cleaning up air, 
uh, and they're very generous. Uh, pe- these agencies to clean the air in these areas where the air is dirty have years, five years to ten years at a time, and sometimes longer to plan and implement these changes. It's, I think it's overly generous. It's extremely gen- generous in nature. So, uh, but apparently it's not generous enough. And so, uh, since within the act is built in these penalties, uh, there are people in the valley who feel that, and they're mainly people who, whose business is, are affected by this and are not interested in changing so much. Uh, or feel it's just going to be too costly, even though they're already the beneficiaries of literally, and I can honestly say this, millions of dollars in incentive funding already. They really want the incentive funding to continue, but they don't want to be responsible to actually finish the work or change the way they do business. And so uh, they are demanding that the Clean Air Act be altered to say that, well, if we can't do it, and if it's not our fault, let's say it's because of diesel trucks and the Air Resources Board or the EPA combined with them at the state level are in charge of cleaning up pollution from diesel trucks. Well, you know, we should be penalized for that. Right. But that would somehow imply that the local area had not exhausted every means possible to already clean up the air. And it also takes off the pressure on that community to to continue to work on that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, abdicating your responsibility for a problem is not a way to solve the problem. And and if you abdicate or or give up your responsibility for it, you should get rewarded for that in my block. Right. And and, and as you were... The Air Act has been working just fine. Yes. And it's and it's definitely got us to, you know, uh, allowed us to make so much progress. And um, we need the Clean Air Act. And it's extremely dangerous at at the present moment and the political climate that we're at to open up the Clean Air Act to make any changes. And we have advocated that there are a lot of administrative uh, ways to to go about um, addressing some of the concerns that our, our valley has and, you know, the rest of the state of California is working to maintain all the progress we've made. And so we would hope that um, some of these efforts here um, would would really uh, go away, you know, to, 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 to change the Clean Air Act. Um, you know, there's some bills that were introduced last year and a bill to look out this year is H.R. 806. And so I urge you to to reach out to your representatives to to vote against uh, H.R. 806. Um, and that's on behalf of Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, not KFCF, just to uh, mention that. And, um, you know, there, there, there's that rhetoric that, that we've done all we can, that there's just no way we can meet these standards. And that's, you know, the whole idea of this planning process that we really do think that we have a path to attainment and it's going to take all of the agencies. It's going to take across source categories. And, um, we need to really demonstrate that and exhaust all of our, um, all, options before we can, you know, make that statement. Um, so that's really where we're at. Um, Kevin, we have run out of time. We, I know we could spend hours talking about this, this issue. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And to all of you listening, remember to stay connected to CVAC um, for any upcoming meetings and more information. I urge you guys to go to www.calcleanair.com dot org and you can uh, get in touch with us uh, and learn about upcoming events and our show will air uh, next month on the fourth friday at three thanks kevin thanks everyone for listening